I, I, I get really, uh, <clears throat> I get really frustrated with this kind of thing because, like, I'm obviously trying and trying to grow and whatnot, and I just, I really hate that it's also NFL season, so I feel like my tight end has been turned into Amazon's own wide receiver. <laughs> yes, sports analogies, something nerds will understand. <laughs> every turn they try and <laughs> shut down hate watching so if if i may here yeah. i i can uh share this real, real quick yeah 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 so i just clicked share screen yeah this this is my uh this is my thing here's episode <laughs> one two and three and here's every single other oh. one that has oh, not no. worked Jeez. including <laughs> look at this oh look Eight oh, seconds, gosh. how nice. And yeah, every single sucks. one of them goes through this because it's blocked globally. Buckle up, everyone. This is the episode where any reservations you and I may have had disappear like kids on Epstein's Island. We begin Season 2, Episode 4, in Rune, after Not Gandalf's favorite movie blew Nori and Poppy out of the theaters. The group has now been split, and the amnesiac wanders around searching for the girls when he stumbles upon a house built into the rock, and we get the big reveal of Jack Black's stunt double. Seriously, who's this guy, and why was that turnaround done like it was supposed to be a big reveal? Anyway, Not Gandalf tries explaining who he's looking for, before the piece of paper he's holding turns into 2000 CGI and blows comedically far away and ends up on the branch of a peculiar tree. Then Gandalf notices how big and strong the branch of this tree is, firmly grasping the shaft, then tries to wrench the branch off and use it as a staff. The tree is immediately turned on by how forceful this stranger is being and decides to show rather than tell that his favorite kind of porn is Vor by inhaling Totally Not Gandalf. Then Kung Fu Panda walks over and pulls Gandalf Gandalf out of the tree like a Dixie cup and introduces himself as Tom Bombadil. Fucking shoot me. Dude puts as much effort into singing as I do waking up in the morning. Also, I don't understand how you could possibly get the blue and yellow clothing so wrong, but sure, why not? Not like anything else in this series is accurate. So Gandalf takes a bath when he overhears Tom talking with his wife. When he exits the bathroom, the amnesiac asks where the woman is, to which Tom says, there is no one else here. So either Tom is lying or the voices in his head are evidence of early onset dementia given his age. And since we've heard Goldberry's voice, I can almost guarantee she ain't gonna be a Goldberry when we finally see her. She'll probably be a Blackberry. Either way, the two discuss Gandalf's destiny, and he requests that Bombadil teach him magic. Why Tom would even do this, I have no idea, because he isn't supposed to care at all about the plights of the world. The conversation then shifts topics to a related note about the Dark Wizard and his men. They've ruled this region of Rune for some time, and Bowser regrets teaching Great Value Saruman how to use magic and fears the two will join forces should he teach Gandalf. Again, I ask why would Bombadil be involved in any of this? He's supposed to care so little he'd sooner trade the One Ring for a roll of toilet paper. Instead, he takes on Gandalf as his pupil. Now, we'll stay in Rune to catch up with Nori and Poppy, both of whom have plot armor thicker than a cave troll's erection to have survived being thrown into the next postal code. The two wake up unsure of where they are when they notice one of the trackers is not far behind them, even though they're behind cover. The two run for it and prove they don't have enough brains between them to fill a skull by leaping off the cliff. They tumble down the hill, and just when they reach the stopping point, the technician who was supposed to fire up some dust misses his timing, firing both late and off-camera. These idiots can't even set up a shot right. So this little tumble lands them in the path of, oh god, kill it with fire! Rufio, look how they massacred my boy! Anyway, this desecration's name is Nobody, or Merrimack, because he does have a name, and yes, he is yet another reference. He and Poopy lock eyes, and Nori interrupts, probably out of jealousy, asking about the water he has. This sets him off, because apparently he's stealing it. From who? Only thing in this area is the well with the water and a bloopy. Also, if it belongs to the trackers hunting you down, why do you care about them? Anyway, he brings them to his village in a canyon where they meet the leader, and what the hell? 
hell kind of design is this? She has like seven afros, and her afros have afros. And you'd think she was at least welcoming to others of her kind, but apparently that's too much to ask because this is a village of stores, not Harfoots. Anyway, Afro Mom here is about to kick the pair out because Crappy spoke back to her, and when Nori pleads her case, she cuts them off because she doesn't care. That is, until she mentions their friend, the stranger, is a wizard, Harry. Then she has the two tied up for consorting with wizards. That night, Afro Mom meets with her captives, telling them they'll be thrown out when this happens. Sadak Burroughs was your leader's name. Why did you say that name? This is enough reason for Afro Mom to show Nori a mural telling the story of how a steward pulled an Oregon trail and left to find the Suzat's Haderach. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, got some doom stuck in my throat. I meant Suzat, basically Hobbit Paradise. But the caravan never returned. And again, we go back to this stupid Harfoot song having all the answers. Then the two trackers arrive and... To what do we owe the pleasure? I like this one. You know, besides the healthy dose of equality, this scene could have looked better if only everyone's line of sight actually lined up. She's looking over this dude's head, this dude has his priorities straight, and the best tracker ever is probably eyeing the snack table off screen. Then the trackers leave to get totally not Saruman to beat them up. Now, let's leave Rune and head towards Pelergear, where Isildur and Erendir search for Theo. They and the search group return to the campsite where Theo was taken, finding only flower petals. The group heads in one direction direction while the Fresh Prince notices a lit torch through the brush. The torch is planted in the ground next to a severed arm. Whose arm is this? Presumably a day has passed, so this must be one of the people from the search party, but why no sounds of violence? Because we have a mystery to solve. That couldn't possibly have been given away by the people being vacuumed up into the trees after the one guy kept chopping one, and this dude is impaled with numerous roots. Nah, it was probably a cave troll. The next day, the people debate on what to do, and Erendir begins to question Estrid because thankfully in Middle-earth, there is no hashtag believe all women. Chicken Legolas notices the burn on her back when he confronts her, so revealing who she is, he shackles her, then she, Erendir, and Isildur search for another camp, following a path of destroyed trees and ruined earth. A dead scar, if you will. Then Artax here walks straight into the mud. He starts sinking, then when trying to pull him out, both he and the Fresh Prince are pulled under. Then Asterix like, fuck this and bails. Nah, she returns with a branch and uses it to help, but she awakens a Phyrexian horror. How does Isildur even have a leg? Whatever, Blackalus cuts through the worm and the two burst out of it. Apparently, this is one of the nameless things from, you know, miles and miles below Middle Earth, but sure, why not cram yet another reference into this mess? So the trio camps and Isildur is given the choice to free Estrid. He does, and she immediately draws his sword. Giggity. Then Erendir's like, put that sword down! Now! But it's too late as the charging end reveals her favorite movie is Fellowship of the Ring and reenacts Sauron's golf swing. Yay! So surely Estrid's dead, and the two are now face to face with a pair of unhappy Ents. The Ents are bent out of shape because of the destroyed trees, presumably by Adar and the Orcs. Now, facing the threat of being smashed themselves, the Fresh Prince of Rizdor makes a promise the woods will be protected, and he basically does this by seduction. I'm not kidding. He places his hand on her arm, feels it up, and reassures her he will not let any more trees be harmed. She then gives him a flower to remember her by before walking away to add an elf tab to end hub because once you go black walnut you don't go bark now that he's perked her stigma this is enough to convince her to open up the tree cage theo and a few of adar's followers were held in why are any of these people alive if the ants are furiously killing almost anyone who crosses their paths? Not a fucking clue, but I'm sure it's because plot armor is buy one, get one free. Theo is released, for some fucking reason promoted to leader of Pelergear, and Isildur is cock-blocked. Not because Estrid is dead, no. Somehow, but no. Rather because her betrothed was one of the prisoners. Lovely. Lastly, we jump over to Linden, where Elrond prepares a small fellowship, as it were, for the travel to Eregion, since no one has ever heard of carrier pigeons in Middle-earth. Elrond still has as much trust in Galadriel as I do the election process, but still asks for her input on whom to take with them. And since this is of the utmost importance, requiring extreme haste. 
the group travels on foot. One travel montage of the elves walking over a mountain instead of taking any of the damn roads later, they arrive at a fallen bridge. Galadriel immediately says, No natural force could have done this. It must be the work of Sauron. No natural force? Bitch, you literally tanked a pyroclastic flow that terraformed the near entirety of the Southlands into Mordor. The clouds will remain for the foreseeable future, and entire forests were reduced to ash like a California wildfire. But yeah, sure, only Sauron could have done this. Also weird, your old personality decided to rear its ugly head after you decided to estrange Elrond while still wearing Nenya. Anyway, the group debates which alternate route to take. The longer path, which will add two weeks to the jury- oh, hold the fuck on. People fast travel across Middle-earth all the time, and now people care about overnight shipping? Whatever, Elrond decides to go south to save time, but Galadriel warns them that Tyrn Gorthad is south and dangerous. But his forehead knows all, so they travel there and the area fills with fog like they just stepped into Wallachia. Next to a bunch of suspicious-looking mounds, the group finds the remains of the messengers sent to Eregion. Oh, and look, they had a horse because of how important this message was. Feel like a bunch of idiots, don't you guys? Anyway, the team is on edge when, out of nowhere, Hellraiser Chains latch onto the Black Elf like his name was Toby and drag him into the Barrows. <laughs> yep, we get to watch Amazon put a Black Elf in chains. It's like they walked on the remains of the Battle of Gettysburg and we just witnessed the Revenge of the South because what killed him is a Barrow White. I don't even care that these things aren't supposed to exist until the Third Age. This scene made me laugh so hard the milk shooting out of my nose could deal 1d8 damage. Anyway, so Nick Cannon Fodder is dead, and the Barrow Whites rise, so Galadriel takes this moment to tell everyone her favorite movie is The Avengers as the camera orbits the group who only now decide to pull out their weapons. Couldn't have done that earlier. The Barrow Confederates then slowly inch forward like 80s slasher villains as the team attacks but to no avail, as each white pays two mana to regenerate. It is in in this moment, Elrond Half-Tarded remembers his favorite show is Supernatural, and that he learned that these creatures are permanently killed by their own weapons. Man, are they lucky this one Barrow had all the weapons, and that each white was conveniently struck by the weapon they owned in a previous life. Otherwise, this scene would have required the collective power of a hamster wheel to figure out the logistics. So the group mourns the loss of Elfie Bryant, and later spot a detachment of orcs. Just then, some arrows fly in their direction, but Elrond tells them not to do anything and stay quiet, because because the orcs, who see better at night, for some reason didn't spot the elves or Elrond's forehead between them and the horse they shot at. Uh, wait a second, where'd the horse even come from? No time to get that answer, as this elf is struck with an arrow in his liver and turns to Elrond like, help me, and collapses. His pained groans draw the attention of the orcs who slowly approach. Then Galadriel harnesses her inner Raylo and heals his wound. Yep, halfway through season two, and girl boss Ladriel is back. She heals the pincushion, hands Elrond Nenya for safekeeping, tells him to return to Lin Linden. Wait, why Linden? Again, no time as her life bar appears and another fight scene filmed in one night occurs. All right, just like her fight with the Numenorean volunteers, I'll go over this shot by shot because there are many problems. The first of which is this orc wanting to cut off her right thumb because as we all know, orcs want to be left alone and they aren't evil at all. Then Guy Ladriel mentions her favorite anime is Naruto as she throws a bunch of knives at the advancing orcs. She then fires an arrow at a third orc who runs a few paces before doing a stupid trick flip so she can ignite her arrows on his torch. You can even watch the dude prep to make the jump when the arrow is stuck in him. Girl boss then ignites her arrows on his falling torch, which is interesting because I never would have thought elves forged arrowheads out of magnesium. Then she fires the two arrows into a pair of orcs that ignite like they've been holding in a fart for weeks, who are nowhere near the horse in the background, by the way. Then they are right next to the horse, and the one stuntman stays bent over like he dropped his glasses so Galadriel can use him to to step up and get on the horse. Now, hold on a second. You might be wondering, why isn't this horse flinching because of the fire? Well, that's easy, because the trainer is whispering in its ear to keep it calm. Then she jumps off the dude's back and 
misses kicking not one, but two orcs in this shot. This guy, since neither of them can see through fire, and this one, because he's a country mile away in the foreground. Then this orc swings his sword over her as she lies backwards on this horse who's still talking to his trainer, and he misses because Morphid Clark continues to miss her timings. Do you see how high this dude swings his sword to miss breaking her nose? Anyway, she spins the bow to shoot another orc because none of the 40 orcs around her, some with bows do anything. She then remembers her favorite game series is Castlevania when she grabs a chain from around the horse's neck and starts whipping the orcs, but is careful not to whip the horse handler who is still desperately trying to keep this horse from bucking Clark off. Discount Sonia Belmont then whips a few orcs and wraps this one. Now, you might be wondering, how are they doing this all in camera even with a plastic chain? That's the problem, it's not real. In fact, the CGI department didn't put the chain in her hands correctly, so when Galadriel pulls the chain, you'll see she isn't pulling anything since it's in one hand. <laughs> one billion dollars, everybody. So the horse trainer finally lets the horse go, and she rides away, grabbing a torch this bunch of orcs offer her since they aren't even looking at her. She throws it up in the air, strikes it with an arrow, which causes it to explode, raining down on a few orcs who are huddled together, because of course they are. We then get a brief intermission where Elrond says she's doing this to save the ring and not the elves, because this dipshit still hasn't changed his tampon. And then we cut back to the action, because Guy Ladriel ruins Gandalf's quote by saying, Go back to the shadow! <laughs> Now, pay close attention to all the fuck-ups in this moment. She demonstrates her brilliant combat prowess by charging into the orcs, then knocks an arrow in a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment. Then, it cuts to a front shot where she hasn't done that before cutting back to the wide shot with the bow lowered. Then, she gets whipped and dragged off the horse. Notice the bow disappears when she comes off the horse, and it reappears on her right side, with an arrow ready on top of it. And then she rolls over and ignites the tip and waits a million years before Adar grabs the arrow, extinguishing it even though he wasn't there. And so ends the hilariously terrible episode 4. So, as I've detailed, this is the episode where the quality of the show jumps off a cliff like Elrond half-tarded. I have no more reservations. They've all evaporated because the show has reverted back to its true form of pure corruption and unoriginal ideas. Gilgalad has done absolutely nothing of value this entire time, except make me question whether or not he is played by a bunch of stacked turkeys in a trench coat. Elrond is one of the wisest of all elves, yet he cannot get over himself, and even after a lesson of humility from Cure de he still does not trust Galadriel even after she healed the injured elf. And that's not even talking about the litany of problems that is Galadriel. An extreme character that was reined in to try to appease fans like myself, but all of that is for naught because she's back to being who she was. I also do not understand how anyone in favor of this show could give it a pass when characters are inconsistent. Last episode tried to sell everyone on the ridiculous idea that orcs just want to be left alone to raise families in peace. But you jump to this episode, and they're actively hunting down elves, destroying large swaths of forest, and gleefully threaten to torture others to get their way. Actually, it makes sense now, because the orcs are basically environmentalists. I also feel dirty watching this show because this isn't an adaptation of Tolkien's work as much as it is a made-for-TV snuff film like Hostel went public on Twitch. Let's start with the references I lost track of. Stores, Merry Mac, Rory Mac, Barrow Whites, Tom Bombadil, Old Man Willow, and Wives deciding which direction to travel. Direct quotes from previous works it doesn't end. This was one of the critical flaws shared by Alien Romulus. Numerous references to other, better projects we've already experienced before, and as I mentioned in that review, I'll repeat here. It's not the repetition that's the problem, it's the way it was executed. The Nameless Thing is not a bad reference because it's something fans are curious about. It's stupid because that thing has jaws like a bobbit worm, and somehow Isildur is still in one piece. 
Tom Bombadil's presence isn't the issue, since the whole of Arda may as well be his backyard, it's that his character is a night and day difference from who he is supposed to be. Tom is supposed to care so little for the goings-on in Middle-earth that when he puts on the One Ring, it doesn't affect him. But now, he's directly involved, because he trains the wizards in the way of magic and led to the oppression of the people of Rune. The Gandalf quote, go back to the shadow, has no elements to support it because the action scene as a whole is about as well executed as a high school play. The acting, choreography, special effects, and music all fail to elicit any emotion, especially with a character as unlikable as Galadriel. Yet, this is the only tactic those behind this show have to rely on key dangling. Because no one who demands quality is going to give a shit about this show, so the question must be asked of people who disagree. If you are someone who disagrees with me, or just about anyone else on the overwhelmingly popular and accurate disdain for this show, I ask you sincerely, do you like being treated like an idiot? I genuinely want to hear your reasons, because I can't imagine you like being treated as a used Kleenex. So if you made it this far, please, Comment below, give me your reasoning. I want to hear it. And as always, for all of you, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.